Welcome back to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Um, this is sort of part two, and we are uh, um, <clears throat> beginning, well, continuing our discussion and um, of uh, an opioid uh, use disorder um, response bill. And we have a, uh, a third or fourth draft that we are uh, looking at right now. And uh, Legislative Council is going to, um, um, I, I guess I think what makes sense is because we haven't really seen it as a whole, is for Legislative Council to go through the, uh, the th I think it's a three-part bill, um, and uh, we'll go through the whole bill, and then we will take each section in terms of a general, just in terms of making, answering questions, and whether or not have an informal poll, whether we agree to insert that that section, and we'll see as far how far we can get um, by noon, and then we will be back by uh, one o'clock. So have an hour for lunch. We're on um, <laughs> six twenty one draft three point one, right? Not the two point one. Okay, three point one three three. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Lynn, Office of Legislative Council. We're looking at draft 3.1. The changes are highlighted in yellow, so we can track them. Um, the first section. Um, um, Katie, I'm going to suggest that you not just go through the changes because. Uh, yep, got it. We've gotten. Yes. Uh, I'll review the whole bill. So the first section is section one. And if you remember, um, we. There's been a change. Um, so this section has to do with the operation of syringe service programs. Um, I'm going to skip us to subdivision A2 and then go back up. Um, so just to refresh your memory, there the language that we reviewed last time we looked at this, um, it hasn't changed. But the idea is that the language that is being struck through limits where this service can be provided and that by striking through the language and which is operated by an aid service organization, a substance abuse treatment provider or a licensed healthcare provider or facility, um, that that expands the entities and locations where um, that program can be um, operated. And then I'll bring us back up to A1 now. Um, I, I should have highlighted this, um, but the definition of drug paraphernalia um, does not include, so um, does not include needles, syringes in this language or other harm reduction supplies. I think that was a change that's been um, since the last draft and it's not highlighted. So I wanted to flag that for you. Um, okay. I will continue. So, um, the next section has to do with the prior authorization for MAT, and this looks different from the last time you've spent. The actual substance um, piece that we'll get to in section three is largely the same, if not exactly the same. Um, what's different is that this section two um, amends the definition of health insurance plan that is applicable to the MAT section to include Medicaid. And and then just to give you the pic big picture and I'll go through each section. Um, after this section two and three, there are sections um, four and five that pretty much revert to the law as it is now with, without including this um, Medicaid language. And that takes effect July 1, 2025. So there's a three year window where this language um, would be effective in applying to Medicaid. So to look at the actual language itself, um, first is section two, and we're amending the, the definition section. And this is in the same chapter as the MAT language. A health insurance plan means any health insurance policy or health benefit plan offered by a health insurer as defined in section 9402, as well as Medicaid and any other public health care assistance program offered or administered by the state or any subdivision or instrumentality of the state. The term does not include policies or plans providing coverage for a specified disease or other limited benefit coverage. 
And then section three. Ask a question. Yeah. Um, so in other work across the hall um, on covered, uh, on things impacting different plans, there are certain types of plans like self-insured plans that we're not able, as I'm learning, we're not able right. to dictate. Right. And so it, does this exclude those plans? Um, I would I would have to confirm that, um, that, that those are excluded. Um, I believe they are, but I'm not gonna, but let me, let me confirm and get okay. back to you. All right. I believe that, that is the intent. You can't, I mean. Right, I, I was just reading this to be more inclusive, but I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly what 9402 says. So, um, so the question is: Does the does this language exclude self um, things we can't include? Self administered right hands. The things we can't include because of federal um, and employment. Let me get you an answer when you come back from lunch. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Section three. This is the language you have seen before on the prior authorization requirements. Um, subsection A has some new, new language in it, not new since the last time you've seen it, but new, newly proposed language. Um, a health insurance plan shall not require prior authorization for prescription drugs for a patient who is receiving MAT if the dosage prescribed is within the FDA's dosing recommendations or during the first 60 days of MAT when the medication is prescribed to a patient for opioid or opiate withdrawal. And then we have a new subsection B, health insurance plan shall cover the following medications without requiring prior authorization. One medication within each therapeutic class of medication approved by the FDA for treatment of substance use disorders, and one medication that is a formulation of a buprenorphine monoproduct approved by the FDA for the treatment of substance use disorders. And then we're um, redesignating the existing subsection B to be subsection C. Cool. The next two sections, um, the, the goal is to revert back to what is now existing law on July 1, 2025. So if you see in um, the definition section, we're getting rid of the new language um, that was added in section two, and we're going back to the definition as it is now. Mm -hmm. In section five, right? Uh, I'm in, we do that in section five too. I just went over section four. And so the, the impact of this or the import of this is that this gives a three-year window to evaluate the impact of the policy change. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in essence, the change that you're making in two and three are, are sunset. They go away. I have a drafting question. Why don't we just put a sunset in? I was thinking about how to do that, but you're not getting rid of the whole, <laughs> I had thought about this a lot last night. You're not getting rid of the sections, you're reverting back. Um, and I was thinking it would be harder to track if there is a piece in session law versus, and the way this would look in the green books is you'd have the paragraph and you'd have a header that says, this is in effect until, July 1, 2025, and then underneath it, you'd have a paragraph that says this takes effect July 1, 2025. Okay. So it really, it, it is for tracking on some level. Yeah, I think it would be easier to, to track and also easier for somebody who's looking in the green books to understand the law, to see this is what it is now, but it is set to change, if that makes sense. Okay, and then if, if three years down the road, we find out that, um, or the earth hasn't shattered and um, we want to continue this. Mm -hmm. Then we would amend this bill and we would repeal sections four and five and we'd amend the effective date section that makes them take effect on July 1, 2025. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Excellent. Okay. So the second piece of this um, is the section five. And again, the idea is to revert back to the language that's in place now. So you'll see that section five undoes the work that section three does. Okay. And then on page six, there is a new section six that the committee hasn't seen yet. And this is a reporting section. The honor before February 1st, 2023, 2024, and 2025, Eva is to report the, um, to the committees of jurisdiction regarding prior authorization processes for medication assisted treatment in Vermont's Medicaid program during the previous calendar year, including first, which medications required prior authorization, second, how many prior authorization requests the department received. And of these, how many were approved and denied? And third, the average and longest length of time the department took to process a prior authorization request. And we move out of MAT. And um, the next section you have seen, although there are some changes, this is the overdose prevention site working group. Um, so first in subsection A, we're creating the working group and recognition of the rapid increase in overdose deaths across the state with a record number of opioid related deaths in 2021. There is created this working group to identify the feasibility and liability of implementing overdose prevention sites in Vermont. And then we have the membership of the group. And there have been um, several changes here. So we have the commissioner of health or designee, the commissioner of public safety or designee, uh -huh. a representative appointed by the state's attorney's offices, uh -huh. two representatives appointed by the League of Cities and Towns from different regions of the state, two individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder, including at least one of whom is in recovery, one member appointed by the Howard Center Safe Recovery Program and one member appointed by the uh, Vermont Association of Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. Again, that's the same language you drew from um, H711. In uh, subdivision six, the program director from the Consortium on Substance Use, the program director from the Howard Center Safe Recovery Program, a primary care prescriber with experience providing medication assisted treatment within the hub and spoke model appointed by the clinical director of ADAP or its successor. An emergency department physician appointed by the Vermont Medical Society and a representative appointed by legal aid. And then we have the powers and duties of the working group. First to conduct an inventory of overdose prevention sites nationally. Second, identify the feasibility and liability of both publicly funded and privately funded overdose prevention sites. Third, make recommendations on municipal and local actions necessary to implement overdose prevention sites. And lastly, make recommendations on executive and legislative actions necessary to implement overdose prevention, if any. Can I just ask a question? Um, conduct an inventory of overdose prevention sites nationally. It just seems like a big project when what we're really looking for is some examples, right? There aren't that many. There aren't, okay. There are like four, five. Yeah. Okay. It just, you know, when you say inventory, you get this sense of big, but. If we did internationally, then it would be a big, okay. <laughs> big job. But really looking at how other states have been able to do it, seeing if there's anything that could transfer over to Vermont. Okay. Um, and just a question on number four, line eight. Is it intentional that it reads um, necessary to implement overdose prevention and not overdose prevention sites? Okay, I had a miss out there. So oh, thanks. My mistake. That should be overdose prevention sites. Thank you. Uh, Tapper, you have your hand up. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I, I bring this up often. Um, are there any other uh, agencies that can do the things that the Howard Center does? It, 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 I, I bring this up often. I think Chittenden County has too much to say about what happens in the state. 
and we continue doing it. And and I, I would like to see what other parts of the state could would recommend, other agencies. That's just a personal feeling that I've had for a long while. I think there are other people and other agencies that can help us just as much. Not, and I, I'm not trying to run down to Howard Senate, they do great work. I just think that we should, as we go forward, look for other agencies that can do the same thing to help us. I absolutely hear you, Topper, on this one. And, and just for uh, reasoning why um, we have the program directors of the Consortium on Substance Use and Howard Center Safe Recovery, is that these are the two organizations who have done pretty extensive work so far on what implementation of an overdose prevention site would look like in the Burlington area, as well as the Brattleboro area. So we kind of have a, a north and south. Um, I was hoping for someone centrally as well, but we do not have interested parties or organizations there yet. So it's kind of top and bottom, but I hear you on getting more perspectives than just Chittenden County. And that is where potentially a private a primary care prescriber or emergency room department and the um, physician or um, a representative from the Vermont League of Cities and I mean, so those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, other parts of the state. Uh, so, yeah. And in terms of other parts of the state, I'm Topper and I, 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 I um, uh, as, as a representative small has, was outlining and thinking about who might be here. Um, based on my experience testifying in front, no, I wasn't testifying, I was, I was listening <laughs> to the um, uh, <clears throat> Appropriations Committee talking about prior bills that we have presented to them this year. They um, don't like working groups and they want the numbers as soon as small as possible so every time Taylor said said another name, I said no. Uh, <laughs> no, what I said is you have to cut it down. You have to cut it down. Um, <laughs> and to that point, I meant to let you know that we'll be removing the representative from Vermont Legal Aid and okay. cutting down, as we say. You say you have cut that one out. Yes, it's it's still in this draft, but. Okay. Um, didn't we have a one time almost 10 people from around the state appointed by oh, the well, cities and towns? That was from 7 uh, Eleven. Okay. Um, this one, I had three representatives, but we marked it down to two representatives to reduce the number. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I'm learning from James. <laughs> okay. May that change. Um, let's see, we had just gone through powers and duties. So we were at subsection D on page eight. And this hasn't changed that the group is to have the support of the Department of Health. As far as a report, um, by November 15th of 2023, the group is to submit a written report to the committees of jurisdiction with its findings and recommendations for legislative action. Huh? Um, meetings. Subdivision one, the commissioner of health or designees to call the first um, meeting to occur by September 15th of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, the committee is to select a chair from among its members at the first meeting, a majority, the membership constitutes a quorum and the group ceases to exist on November 15th, 2023 mm -hmm. um, when its report is due. Then we have the standard language for compensation and reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So it's eight meetings. The first paragraph deals with the um, legislative members. Although I think you remove, did you remove the legislative members? We did indeed. You did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I kept making suggesting it gets smaller. And <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So let me update that. They'll never. You know, they haven't gotten to the pilot programs part. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I removed paragraph G1, and now um, paragraph G2 is just G, and instead of other members, it says members uh -huh. of the working group. Um, yeah. So 
standard language, uh, eight meetings and the payments come out of the um, health department's budget. And then we have a definition of overdose prevention site. Mm -hmm. That is it for the working group section. Pilot uh, programs go around section eight. I thought we talked about H. Um, about H. We did um, acquired instead of purchased. Purchased. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. And I didn't highlight it. We previously acquired regulated drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very true. Okay. On line 16, Katie, program is got a. Oh, yes. Instead of an o. Thank you. Okay. So typo corrected, page eight. Uh, nope, page nine, line eight. Okay. So the next three sections are the pilot program sections. Section eight has to do with the um, mobile medication assisted treatment. Um, so in fiscal year 23, 450,000 is appropriated from the general fund to ADAPT for the purpose of awarding one or more grants for mobile MAT services in accordance with federal laws. Award the grants based on applicants' ability to provide MAT, including methadone, to currently underserved areas of the state. We want a DAP and its success. So we went back and forth, and I thought we had decided said no, because no, because it's, it's special law. Okay. But I just right. am remembering that um, in the previous section, section seven, seven, and one of the appointments, we do say the successor. So we should at least be consistent. Be consistent with them. Um, I'm fine to take out. You want to take it out? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll just write in a section seven successor. So what did, what did you just go? So what? Um, in section seven, where we have an appointment that's being made by um, ADA, it's on page seven, line 17, we're removing the phrase or its successor. Plus words. Okay. So that brings us to section nine on page nine. Um, in fiscal year 23, 250,000 is appropriated from the general fund to ADAP uh, to award one or more grants to an organization or organizations providing substance use treatment counseling or substance use recovery support or both for individuals within and transitioning out of the criminal justice system. The division shall award grants based on an applicant's ability to accomplish the following. First, uh, provide justice involved individuals with direct substance use support services while incarcerated such as through alcohol and drug abuse counselors. Um, I left out the word abuse on the last draft, so that's been changed. Right. Or certified recovery coaches or both. Subdivision two, support justice involved individuals in their transition out of incarceration, <clears throat> such as through referrals to existing statewide resources for substance use treatment or recovery. Or provide long-term support for justice involved individuals such as coordinating peer support services or ongoing counseling post-incarceration. Uh -huh. And then the last of the three pilot programs is section 10. Uh -huh. In fiscal year 23, 180,000 is appropriated from the general fund to ADAP to award four <laughs> grants to organizations to provide or facilitate connection to substance use treatment recovery and harm reduction services at the time of emergency response over emergency response to overdose. And the division is to award grants based on the applicant's ability to support individuals at risk of fatal overdose by facilitating warm handoffs to treatment, recovery and harm reduction services through coordination between public safety, emergency medical services, substance use treatment and healthcare providers uh, and substance use recovery services. And then um, the effective date section, um, the bill takes effect July 1, 2022. And then this um, language highlighted reflects that we're removing those section or the sections four and five don't take effect 
um, until July 1, 2025. And as you remember, that revert back to the existing language. Mm -hmm. What was that last comment? I'm sorry. Um, so the in the effective date section, the highlighted language, um, those sections four and five don't take effect until July 1, 2025. And if you remember, the purpose of those two sections is to revert back to the existing law as it is now. It's, it, it basically sunsets that um, change in sections two and three. I have a question. Yep. So the, the language we have under the pilot program, um, particularly with regard to warm handoffs to treatment, recovery, and harm reduction, I'm just wondering why we're not using that warm handoff language in, on the incarcerated section prior in section nine. Um, uh, I, I guess my thought is that I think that people need more than um, you know a, a referral, um, and I think that our recent experience with overdose deaths during the pandemic after release from incarceration is proof of that. So would it work to say such as through referrals and warm handoffs to existing statewide resources? I would put, I would put warm handoffs. Instead of referrals. Instead of, okay, got it. I'm, that's just me. I'm just putting that out there as a suggestion. Well, we have any okay. others, right? Like that's that's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. The other and the assistance. Right. Well, it feels like that was the actual intent. Yeah. As well. yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Disagree. So I would like to bring something to the committee's attention that's not easy to see within this version as presented, which um, our prior draft included language around uh, peer delivered. A syringe exchange, and we received feedback. Um, well, that's uh, not included in this, right? And you can't see the strikeout because it's just taken from the draft. And so basically some of the feedback that we received from the department was that that was really sort of the first point that they had reservations about. And we started to discuss, um, you know, could we have them report back on the feasibility of it? But I also sort of learned through their testimony and some of the testimony from Vermont Cares that um, this is happening um, to an extent within their existing flexibility of uh, guidelines. But I understand this is a pretty significant change, so I wanted to open it up to uh, discussion. Um, I I actually had that as a question, and I. Um, I think the removal of the limitation language will give the opportunity to expand mm -hmm. um, and without <clears throat> needing to, to say expand mm -hmm. at some level. I mean, a, a different group um, might be able to come um, and meet the requirements. Um, <clears throat> what you might want to do, because I got a copy of it as well, is share with the committee. The, um, the uh, Department of Health has a six page, um, not quite sure bulletin or something um, around what are the qualifications, what are the steps for um, uh, something like this for syringe exchange um, programs. And, uh, so you can see that it's it's not something that I can go, oh, this is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do this. I want to do this. Yeah. And they go, okay, you want to do this, but you have to be able to give reports and you have to meet certain criteria. Um, and uh, that, that they have developed internally. Um, they have, it's um, not since, they have not updated it in the past eight years, not 10 years, 10 years. So, you know, hopefully they will, um, updated. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm fine with taking out the language and you know having it be as it is. Um, the the one thing that I I guess I just want to bring up as a um, uh, a point, um, not only with regard to substance use services, but um, um, the impact of having um, peer support services. It really in any realm, um, but, um, and um, I, I 
um, have a, a, a bias that I don't feel like state government adequately recognizes the value of peer um, support and peer provided services. And um, so I appreciate it's later on in the bill, you know, that we just talked about. Um, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, the Department of Health has, you know, this six page long <laughs> list of criteria you have to pass and probably although I don't know this for a fact, uh, you know, a peer support organization might have more difficulty in meeting those requirements. Um, but part, not but, and <laughs> one of the things that we talked about yesterday is the <coughs> sort of um, uh, inclusion of peer support, you know, perhaps within an existing um, provider. Um, and I just, putting out there that I, I feel like it's important for us to recognize the value of peer supports um, and services in our formal human service systems. Um, and I, I just sort of question whether we recognize that sufficiently as well. Mm -hmm. um, but at this, this moment, is, I'm sorry. Go, well, I was gonna say, this is just nowhere <clears throat> addresses necessarily your comment. But the last line says such programs shall be operated. And if we put such programs, comma, including peer support, peer, including peer programs, uncomma, comma, shall be operated in it. <laughs> what page are you on now? In, in other words, just to highlight <clears throat> those. I mean, I know it doesn't address what you're talking about, but it puts the concept of peer support. Yeah, that's talking. That. That's talking about hazardous waste management. Well, no, I, but it's it's the only place where they. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd offer something up. Um, uh, I've been thinking about it since we just received this morning the guidelines. Um, the six pages for syringe exchange. I had the chance to read through them. And there is no mention of any kind of, uh, say, training for uh, peers to, to become staff, uh, you know, to be oriented into this organization. And perhaps there is value in specifics around that. Um, I would say that, judging by the fact that uh, the guidelines are 10 years old, Maybe we could ask to say, hey, can you take a look at them and report us back on what your potential updates might be to reflect current practice? Including the and potential and including and this capacity. Yeah. 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 And I did notice that number two on the guidelines is just a reiteration of the law that we just are right. proposing to change, which is, I think, number two says they shall be aid service organizations, substance use. So they're going to have to modify. They're going to have to update. So, yeah. so to put that in there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I think uh, at lunch, I'll send out maybe a draft uh, paragraph about that. that people but you don't have better. to send it out in advance. It can be in the next okay. um, mm -hmm. iteration. Thank you for uh, listening um, to that concern. I appreciate it. I mean, I think it really just grows on, I mean, we heard really wonderful testimony yesterday as to the impact of peer supports um, and that right now when it comes to those peer supports, it's, it's untrained. It's folks who are in community who care a whole lot and are able to do this, but I think there is such a value in offering both that professional development as well as making sure that they're able to do those warm handoffs that we're bringing up so often throughout the bill. Right. Well, and we have seen um, through... Um, you know, on multiple occasions in this committee, um, testimony from recovery centers, and those are largely peer operated mm -hmm. or um, at least staffed um, mm -hmm. services. And they, uh, those, that testimony over the course of the years has really impacted me in terms of thinking about how peers can assist other individuals. Um, and uh, so, you know, expanding that into other areas, um, I think, or at least looking at it. Um, before we uh, ask Katie to do that in part of this, whether it's definition or something, I'd like a, um, a show of hands as to in this particular area of the bill, 
which um, I want to say, which expands um, the, the potential um, definition of who can be um, a syringe provider if there is a majority of the committee who supports at least concluding that one piece in the bill. Well, that's the one issue that the department is concerned about. Is that right? But so what we're, I, can, can I yeah. reframe that just a little bit? Yeah, please I, mean, do. <laughs> I mean, I think what, what uh, Representative Whitman is proposing um, is that we uh, sort of have language in here that asks the department to uh, revise and update those guidelines with a focus <laughs> to include peer support. Right. Um, so it doesn't necessarily change what we're doing exactly right here, but it asks the department to consider mm -hmm. um, peer supported services in that update. So it doesn't authorize, but has them considered. Well, if they if they update it to include those services, yeah. then it would, but we don't have to say that in here is what I guess. Is what it I doesn't mean. require them. It, doesn't require. it does not require it. It makes it a possibility. Right. I think that's what, yes, you're, that's what I'm saying. saying. Yeah. And our language in uh, previous drafts was actually really targeted. So it was peer delivered syringe services. Right. Um, so this is broadening it to peer supports and how we include peers in, in the recovery treatment work. Well, and I think the, uh, the prior draft was almost a requirement. It was. <laughs> and so this is not, this is opening the door but not requiring um right that's what i just want to make sure carl understands that right so so it's not requiring it carl it's just asking them to consider update this their, and update okay. it okay. Well, um, i just don't want to do something that mm -hmm. has the department at tremendous odds with us on, i understand you know, yeah. to implement this i think it's important mm -hmm. to implement yeah stuff. you don't want them to be at odds Sure. Yeah, that's a great point. I think it's sort of a way of threading the needle of asking them to sort of consider something that um, be beneficial. Yes. Don't mind. <laughs> Don't mind him. <laughs> Somebody in in uh, well, uh, is going to draft something that that says that. Is that what we're saying now? You're right, and um, uh, Topper. Before we were asked, before we asked Katie to do that, <clears throat> I wanted to get a a a, um, a a sort of show of hands of people who are um, at this point interested in going forward with that one piece. As long as it's not prescriptive, right? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> So um, to be clear, this is sort of like a report asking them to address um, yeah, I, what's changing in the new guidelines and how I to think it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think okay. maybe less of a report and right. they will have an update. Yeah. I mean, I think I think we okay. They will have an update. They will update their I mean, review and update as necessary. Yeah. Uh, whatever that document was that they forwarded to us. <clears throat> <Yeah. Okay. clears throat> Madam Chair? Yes. I have I have one uh, little concern. Absolutely. Uh, back on page seven. And unless I misunderstood what happened there, did number eight get taken out altogether? No. No. <clears throat> and number eight stays. We just removed the language or its successor to be consistent throughout the bill. <laughs> but um, Topper, what it would read now is a primary care prescriber with experience providing medication assisted treatment within, within the hub and spoke model appointed by the clinical director of alcohol and drug abuse programs. Yes. Oh, so you okay. took out or its successor. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Dane, could you e explain? The sunset. Mm -hmm. um, or so we say, why the sunset and why not just put it in place? And if people don't like it, they'll 
change it in future years? Absolutely. Um, I think it was mostly just wanted to put the proposal forward based off of some of the suggestions from Representative Wood yesterday. Um, it pairs up with three more years of um, reporting based on what are we seeing, any changes within prior authorization. And so I would see it just as sort of another window of time in which we can evaluate, see what the changes are, and then uh, come back and make the decision either to uh, even expand it further if we're seeing that it's not having enough of an impact or bring it back or anything like that. I also felt it was a way to um, <coughs> work with um, both uh, DIVA and the Department of Health who were reluctant about that. And um, when I asked if they would consider something you know, that uh, had a trial period, if you will. Uh, they said they would consider it. <laughs> so um, sometimes when we uh, have a change of policy that people don't really know what the impact is going to be yet, and that would be us, that can be us, or it can be, you know, people that we're asking to implement this. It sometimes uh, is helpful to have a, a period of time where that can be evaluated. That's pretty much what that is. I think it also encourages that uh, uh, that we do something now, <laughs> right? As well, like it, whether it, it's most important that we do something uh, immediately, and then in three years is when we can do some further evaluation and tinkering with it. It's re it really is good policy to be to go back and look to be. It helps us to be more accountable as government, sorry, I know I'm always touting this, but I really do believe that, that it gives us, it sort of forces us to look at those reports and say, oh yeah, it's working or it's not. I wonder why, what, what can we do different? So I'm super supportive of doing this this way. Um. Any other discussion on that? Are there other right now questions? I just have one quick point that was an edit uh, recommended by the department on section 10, page 11. Um, it's just simply on line six, uh, changing the word and to or. Um, so the idea is that this would just provide flexibility and the ability of the department to award grants to any of these organizations. Um, but you'll see below that on number nine that we still continue to have and because we're awarding them based on the merit of their ability to coordinate with all organizations. Um, what I'd like us to do is, um, I think this is a good place to stop and I'd give will be returning at one. And um, as uh, we'll, we will continue, um, I think you know, we, we have sort of broad, we have sort of a, a, a straw poll on the first section and we haven't quite had straw polls on the other sections and I don't wanna rush those at two of um, 12. Um, are you able to come back? Um, Today's early special day for school at one. Oh, okay. So um, in, 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 in 30 seconds, would you come to the table? The first time I've been in the state house in. In a long time and hi, and I'm, I'm sorry, committee. I know I said, but it'll be quick. Rebecca Copans, Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Vermont. I just wanted to come and say, you know, we are here to support you in, in this bill. Um, we do not have any PA on, on MAT. Um, and we're, we support what you're sorry, on, the, on the medicated interest. You don't have any what? We don't have um, prior authorization. Oh, okay. And so we support what you're doing. Uh, we think it's, it's great. Um, we do use quantity limits. Um, and that catches, it's like a, it's a double check to catches, you know, to catch pharmacies if they make mistakes. Um, we've never had a, a prior authorization request um, to go over a quantity limit, but 
if they did come, we'd be happy to uh, consider them. Um, we, um, and we just follow the FDA dosing limit for quantity limits. That's it. Do you have any questions? Okay. That was easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the easiest one. And some of that conversation, um, uh, Dane has had um, either in person or a bunch of us have. Mm -hmm. You were part of that too. Uh, there, there, there was a, a, a call with your boss. Yes, um, I was there too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just on what <laughs> when it happened. <laughs> it didn't happen in the context of the committee. And so um, um, I wanted the whole committee to um, to hear that, yes, we had been communicating um, with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And um, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, OK, committee, so we'll come back at one, and we will sort of go through the other parts in terms of do we have um, um, you know, sort of agreement, you know, do we have at least a you know, majority agreement put the other pieces in and then we'll go through the line by line. Okay. okay. See you at one. Uh, this ends the morning session and we will return.